Okay, welcome everyone um, to the third lecture in our series on the power of imagination and creativity presented by the Center for Values in Medicine, Science, and Technology. Um, my name is Matt Brown. I am the director of the Center for Values. Um, and uh, tonight you're in for a treat. Thinking about the lecture series this year, while of course it is about imagination, it is about creativity, it's about the importance that these notions, these capacities, uh, these activities uh, play in our lives and our understanding of ourselves. The series, also this series, is a lot about synthesis, right? It's a, it's a lot about things coming together um, to, uh, through the power of creativity, through the power of imagination, to make something uh, greater than those things by themselves. Um, so if you think about Mark Johnson's lecture, it was the coming together of ethics and philosophy with cognitive science and psychology through the notion of imagination um, uh, that was uh, the, the powerful synthesis he presented. If you think about Stephen Asma's talk last week, then it's really about uh, the evolution of a, a variety of perspectives on the, the history, uh, uh, the evolutionary history of these capacities of imagination and creativity and how they help us understand ourselves. And our, our speaker tonight um, is going to continue this trend of talking about creative synthesis. Our speaker tonight is, is Ray Armentrout, a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, Guggenheim Fellow, uh, among many other awards and prestigious publications that she has. She's also a Professor Emerita from the University of California, San Diego. Longtime fans of the center will know that University of California, San Diego somehow is our favorite university to draw speakers from. Um, uh, it seems like that sometimes. Uh, and uh, tonight, uh, Professor Armentrout is going to speak to us about uh, a particularly interesting synthesis that can happen at the meeting of poetry and physics. Please join me in welcoming Ray Armentrout. Thank you, Matt. Am I on okay? Can you hear me? All right, good. Staring at a computer screen while while I also try to see you is a little bit. So I'm going to scoot over here. I wanted to ask you because I'm just curious. I'm trying to imagine the audience that would come to this. So how many of you are people who study literature or creative writing? Raise your hand if you are. Okay, not many. How many study like med pre-med or medicine or biology? Okay, a few. How many physics? Okay, a couple, two or three. All right, and the rest of you are mysteries to me. You're poetry fans of some kind, I guess. Um, okay, well, tonight I'm going to try to make a connection between poetry and physics. I realize that's pretty counterintuitive, but consider it a kind of thought experiment. So the theme for this lecture series, as I understand it, is creativity in the arts and sciences. But what is creativity, anyway? In my experience, to be creative is to refuse to compartmentalize. And yet our lives are so compartmentalized. To put this in positive terms, to be creative is to bring together materials or concepts from different realms, from domains that normally don't come into contact. When they do, sparks can fly. On the face of it, there's almost no bigger gap than that between an art like poetry and a hard science like physics. Physics deals with the real, the material world, or so we non-physicists are apt to think. But on second thought, what is matter? What is the matter in the material world anyway? The closer we look, the less substantial it becomes. Einstein famously showed that matter is equivalent to energy. Not only that it can be converted into energy, which is what you might first think, but that it really is energy. 
an activity, not a thing. After all, nothing exists which is not in motion. So you might think of it as a kind of dance if you wanted to be whimsical. More recently, cyberneticists have speculated that matter is a form of information. Now, all, the, all of these metaphors what might suggest that, you know, um, if you're a hammer, everything you see is a nail, but nonetheless. Um, cyberneticists have speculated that matter is a form of information, a kind of code. Looked at in these ways, the terrain of physics doesn't sound all that far from the world of poetry. So what might poetry and physics have in common? First, both poets and physicists tend to equate things. Poets do it with metaphor and simile. Physicists do it more precisely with mathematical equations. Then, both poets and physicists are drawn to conundrums and enigmas. Some scientist, and now I can't remember who it was, but it made an impression on me, said, the most exciting phrase in science is not eureka, it's hmm, that's strange. The words an experimenter might use when an experiment doesn't come out as expected. So instead of disappointment, he was going, oh, that's interesting, because an unexpected result opens up a new line of inquiry. And I can relate to that. Many of my poems also begin with a moment of puzzlement and a sense that there's something here I want to explore further. Despite their roots in questions and enigmas, both physics and poetry value precision and economy. In poetry, we might call that economy compression or concision. In physics, we are accustomed to hearing about the elegance of certain equations. I think that among the sciences and arts, it is poetry and physics that value succinctness most. This may even be what physicists mean when they talk about the beauty of equations. Paul Dirac, one of the originators of quantum physics, probably went a little too far when he said, but he'd already won a Nobel Prize, so you know, he, he, was, he could ha take a little latitude. But when he said, quote, it is more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit experiment. Dirac had faith. He thought that eventually, you know, the experiment was wrong, and eventually it would come out and uh, confirm his, uh, his theories. Dirac had faith, as poet John Keats did, that truth lay in the direction of beauty. But what did he mean by beauty? Dirac, not Keats. Is it related to what non-physicists mean when they talk about the word, when they think of that word? Recently, physicists and I'm going to say his name wrong, I'm afraid. I've never heard it really said out loud. Mikhail Kaku defined beauty like this. One, a unifying symmetry. Two, the ability to explain vast amounts of data with the most economical mathematical expressions. I think it's interesting that a physicist would be motivated to even try defining beauty. But that word beauty keeps coming up if you read the things that physicists say. Um, his may not be the sort of definition that would jump to your mind, and I don't think his definition particularly fits any of my poems, but nonetheless, let's continue with him a bit further. He goes on to say, nature, scientists believe, prefers economy in its creations and always seems to avoid unnecessary redundancies. If I met him, I could tell him that poet Ezra Pound proclaimed more or less the same thing in 1913 when he said that a poem should con contain no superfluous words. Now, <clears throat> to be fair, it should also be noted that in the humanities, over the last few decades, scholars have become leery of the, word, of, of the idea of beauty or the word. I mean, aren't standards of beauty relative and subjective? Don't they vary from culture to culture and from time to time? Yes, but that's a subject for another talk. Among the arts and sciences, it is poetry and physics that are paradoxically most invested in precision and yet also most open to the outrageous, to the wild leap. After all, Niels Bohr's idea 
that electrons in an atom leap from one orbital ring to another without existing anywhere in between is pretty outrageous. It continues to stymie the advocates of common sense. Poetry notoriously, perhaps, makes its own wild leaps. It doesn't necessarily lead you by the hand, step by step, as narrative tends to do. I think that's why it frightens some people. In my poems, for instance, the meta metaphor is more implicit than explicit. My poems are often, though not always, composed of autonomous separate sections, sometimes, separate, sometimes separated by asterisks. I hope these sections are related to one another, but if so, it is not by any material visible bridge. To get from one to another, you need to leap. Of course, there are people who would disagree that poets and physicists have anything in common. I think it was Richard Feynman who said that, quote, while, phys while physics tells us in language everyone can understand, no, I'm gonna start again. While physics tells us what no one knows in language everyone can understand, poetry tells us what everyone knows in language no one can understand. That's witty, but it doesn't seem quite fair. Many of us, for instance, may not find Feynman's equations all that transparent. But I wonder, beyond that, why he was bothering to diss poetry at all. Why was it even on his mind? I rather suspect he must have been a closet poet. And of course, there have been poets across the years who have expressed doubts about science, that science would somehow spoil the magic of things. And I don't mean, you know, not bad poets. In fact, the wonderful poet, Emily Dickinson, has a, a poem, uh, she just numbered her poem, poem um, 861, which I'm gonna try to pull up next, which um, considers, I guess, scientific analysis and what it might do to its object of study. Split the lark and you'll find the music, bulb after bulb in silver rolled, scantily dealt to the summer morning, saved for your ear when lutes be old. Loose the flood, you shall find it patent, gush after gush, reserved for you. Scarlet experiment, skeptic Thomas, now do you doubt your bird was true? Here Dickinson sounds dubious, to say the least, about the value or feasibility of proof. To analyze something is to break it down into component parts, but here we get a very graphic picture of that. Needless to say, it's horrible to consider vivisecting a lark. Clearly you would kill the bird and end the song you hope to understand. This is as graphic and memorable an example of the idea that analysis stultifies as one could imagine. The lark may represent both a lover who doesn't want to be asked for proof of love and or a poet who doesn't want to have to explain her poems. But whether addressed to a lover or a reader or both, we don't have to decide, the poem implies that the drive for certainty can be destructive. Still, Dickinson was a close and un unsentimental observer of the natural world she studied zoology and botany at the girls' school she attended and was extremely interested in those subjects. The very arterial gushes, gush after gush reserved for you, you uh, the arterial gushes evoked in the poem testify to the real world precision of her vision. If Feynman was a closet poet, perhaps Dickinson was a closet scientist. So okay, by now you may be wondering why I care about this. Who, who am I, after all? Um, and I'm certainly not anyone with any true expertise in physics. I, I'm, I don't pretend that. I became engaged with popular books about quantum physics and cosmology, ambivalently at first, in the 1980s. I suppose, like many people, the first such book I read was The Tao of Physics. My, 
impression was that the proliferation, this uh, just at that time, I mean, my impression was that the proliferation of subatomic particles it described was rather absurd. I even wrote a prose poem called Engines that played the names of particles off the names of angels with an eye to that medieval scholastic argument about how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. But however skeptical I initially was, I found that reading about physics always somehow inspired me to write precisely because it puzzled me. The connection to angels in that first physics-related poem of mine was probably no accident. I was raised by an evangelical mother and grew up reading the Bible. I became an agnostic at the age of 12, which caused a lot of problems at home, as you might imagine. But I think I was attracted to cosmology, at least at first, because it addressed the same question Genesis did. How did the universe begin? How will it end? What came before creation? Well, actually, the Bible doesn't address that third question. I thought I came up with that on my own when I was, I don't know, 12 or something. But then it turns out that, of course, uh, theologians and, in a different way, scientists have been asking this or, just, or declaring that it makes no sense to ask this forever. I wonder now why I wasn't motivated to actually study science when I was a teen teenager or a college student. It may have been because, really, girls weren't encouraged back then in my day in the Jurassic period. They, <laughs> girls weren't really pushed very hard in that direction. It was kind of assumed you wouldn't do that. But also, I did feel the pull of literature. It was only when I was well into my 40s that I came back to that early interest in cosmology. Some years after I read The Tao of Physics, I read Brian Greene's The Elegant Universe and was hooked. Books by Brian Cox, Lee Smolin, Lisa Randall, and Carlo Rivelli followed. I read them because I was interested, of course, but also because they left me wondering in a way that led me to write more poems, which is what I wanted to do. Recently, a selection, tiny selection, uh, this is a ch what's called a chapbook, the tiny little book, of poems in conversation with physics came out. I don't know if they, I know that they're selling my, uh, my selected, which looks like this out there. I don't know if they're selling the little book or not, but they might be. Um, one of the poems in this book, well, actually, and also in this one, um, came from an encounter with a living physicist, Brian Keating. I contacted Brian in the summer of 2013. I had seen a documentary, maybe some of you guys saw it too, hosted by the ubiquitous Morgan Freeman on the Science Channel. Freeman intoned a script about the way matter was created as the early universe cooled. And I wasn't, under, I, I wasn't sure I understood what I was hearing. And I thought, I suddenly got the, the bright idea, well, I work at a university. Why don't I get in touch with a physicist who is technically a colleague? Very technically. But so I had uh, our debar department uh, secretary, if we can still use that word, call theirs and uh, ask if anyone would talk to me. And Brian, who's a very kind, sociable person, volunteered. So we had lunch, and I posed my questions. And I can't really remember what they were, because that was a while ago. But it's something about the creation of the universe, which he studies. Um, I think my questions probably weren't very exact, because I don't, he looked a little puzzled. And then I was completely puzzled by his answers. So the poem I'm about to show you that came from our encounter is not a transcription of our conversation by any means. Um, it's kind of a, riff, a comic riffing off of it with two voices. I see it as two voices, but the two voices don't really represent us exactly. Um, and some material I got from a Scientific American article about light I read about the same time also comes into the poem. I just want to say before I put it up <clears throat> that it's the, the poem is deliberately zany or sort of absurdist. So, OK. I'll read it after I get it up. OK. Oh, I have to actually find it in the book to read it. I mean, I know it's up there, but I could just, now I'll read it in the book. Sorry, you're all reading it from me. Here it is. OK. Account. Light was on its way from nothing to nowhere. 
Light was all business. Light was full speed when it got interrupted. Interrupted by what? When it got tangled up and broke into opposite. Broke into brand new things. What kinds of things? Drinking cup, thinking of you, convenience valet. How could speed take shape? Hush, do you want me to start over? The fading laser pulse, information describing the fading laser pulse, is stored, is encoded in the spin states of atoms. God is balancing his checkbook. God is encrypting his account. This is taking forever. The humor comes, such as it is, comes, I think, from the attempt to put the unimaginable birth of the universe into the language of everyday experience, which apart from mathematics is the only way we can conceptualize what we can't otherwise understand. So my use of checkbooks and drinking cups and such things here in conjunction with laser pulses and atomic spin states could be seen as an example of that refusal to compartmentalize I mentioned when I started this talk. This refuse, a, a sort of a refusal to separate everyday life from you know, the, the esoteric discipline of, of physics. So anyway, Brian seemed to enjoy the poem, maybe because it sort of came from our conversation. And he soon suggested that we co-teach a class called Poetry for Physicists. Many campuses, as you know, offer a class called Physics for Poets, which is kind of usually a dumbed down physics class. Brian wanted to do the reverse minus the dumbing down. He thought science students needed to learn to express themselves better, both orally and in writing. And what better way to achieve that than to have them write and speak about poems, relatively short literary works which force us to slow down and really look at the elementary particles of language, the words. We decided that on Tuesdays, Brian would lecture on various topics of interest, and on Thursdays, I would bring in poems that I saw as related to the ideas he had discussed. For example, one Tuesday, Brian lectured on types of symmetry, including the bilateral or mirror symmetry that you often see in life forms, as well as supersymmetry the supersymmetry some theorists believe exists among families of subatomic particles. So the following Thursday, I went over poems that either manifested symmetry or discussed it. One example I gave was William Blake's famous poem, The Tiger, which most of you probably read in high school. I'm going to pull that up and talk about it a little bit. There we go. I'll read it too. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? So what strikes you about that poem? That's a rhetorical question. It might be the pounding rhythm, the stresses, tiger, tiger, but that's iambic, uh, it's not iambic, I'm sorry, trochaic. That's trochaic, by the way, which is an unusual meter. The stresses are so heavy, they feel like hammer strikes. Blake was a Christian mystic who saw visions of angels and demons while working, and yet somehow functional, not a psychotic, uh, while working as an engraver in rapidly industrializing London. Here he appears to be asking the age-old question, which has troubled monotheists, 
How could a good God allow suffering in his creation? How could he create the tiger, the consummate predator, to live alongside the lamb? I mean, not that sheep and tigers actually live, but anyway. Perhaps Blake is obliquely answering this question by imagining the strength and courage it would take to create this tiger, this dynamic living world. I mean, you might think of the life world as a kind of tiger, really. The tiger burns bright. It is heat and light in an otherwise dark forest. An astrophysicist might think of, of a quasar, perhaps, beautiful yet emitting deadly gamma rays. Of course, the tiger is beautiful partly because of its bilateral mirror symmetry, the pattern of its stripes. Well, I get, I'm getting warm. Let me see if I can take my coat off. This always happens to me. It's not part of my act, but it always happens to me. When Blake asks, who would dare frame thy fearful symmetry, he makes it sound as if it's the symmetry as much as the tiger that, evo that evokes fear perhaps by suggesting the hand of an unknowable artist. The tiger is like a lovingly decorated weapon. The God who creates it must be beyond our comprehension. Still, in stanzas two through four, Blake tries to visualize what it would take to create a tiger. He draws his images from the ordinary crafts of his day. In the fourth stanza, we see an anvil, a hammer, and a furnace. We might think about a traditional blacksmith or swordsmith. We might also think about the coal fires powering new factories in England at that time. Or of the primordial fire of volcanoes and stars. God, after all, drew fire from the depths and the skies in the poem to make the tiger's eyes. You know what? Could someone bring a chair over? I'm actually, this is weird, but I'm actually feeling a little faint. But I'm sure I'll be fine if I sit down. I don't know if I can actually, this is going to be dramatic. I'm not really good at things. But, OK. I'll still be able to use my stuff. OK. This should work. So anyway, moving on. The following week, <laughs> hi there. The following week, Brian lectured on objectivity, measurability, and the role of the observer in physics. Okay. It has long been a goal in science, and at least some strains of philosophy, to discover what the world is, what objects are, in themselves, apart from us. For instance, which attributes of an object really belong to it, and which, such as color, taste, texture, are merely a reflection of the way the object interacts with our sense organs. Some say that by this standard, the only real properties of objects are location, mass, and charge. The idea, that these, the idea is that these would be the same whether or not we existed, while color would disappear if there were no eyes to see it. But as most of us know now, experiments in quantum physics have actually long shown that even such seemingly inherent features as the location of quantum objects and the form they take, whether wave or particle, is dependent on whether and how they are observed. It's more difficult to disentangle the observer from the observed than we first imagined. So how have poets engaged with those issues? Well, in different ways over time. It's been pretty natural for contemporary poets to embrace the both and, as opposed to either or, implications of quantum physics. Many of us, including me, are interested in the way multiple meanings can run parallel to one another without resolving into a single interpretation. One could map that metaphorically, if one wanted to, onto the many world theories, many worlds theory of quantum me mechanics. Looking back further over time, though, of course, poets have anthropomorphized the natural world pretty freely and unselfconsciously. But as science took a more prominent place in their lives, in all of our lives, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, poets began trying to introduce something like 
scientific objectivity into their poems, at least some poets did. To illustrate this, I brought in a famous poem called The Snowman, some of you may know this too, by Wallace Stevens, written in 1921. So I'll read that too. One must have a mind of winter to regard the frost and the boughs of the pine trees crusted with snow and have been cold a long time to behold the, ju the junipers shagged with ice, the spruces rough in the distant glitter of the January sun, and not to think of any misery in the sound of the wind, in the sound of a few leaves, which is the sound of the land full of the same wind that is blowing in the same bare place. For the listener who listens in the snow and nothing himself behold nothing that is not there and the nothing that is. In this poem, Stevens imagines what it would take, what it would be like to see a wintry landscape for what it is and not what it is for us. He calls this having a mind of winter. In other words, bringing the subjective into accordance with the objective world. That this isn't really possible is beside the point, or not fully possible. So it's a kind of a thought experiment. How does he get us to imagine this? You might notice that the language becomes starker and starker as the poem progresses. Stephen begins in the first and second stanzas with imagistic descriptions of particular sites, right? Like pine trees crusted with snow, spruces rough in the distant glitter. So here he's giving us what we expect from poetry, imagery. But notice how as the poem proceeds, the language gets barer and deliberately more monotonous. The sound of the wind in the sound of a few leaves, which is the sound of the land, full of the same wind that is blowing in the same bare place. It becomes deliberately repetitive, right? The sensorium shrinks. So look at how he uses the word sound three times and the word same twice in close proximity. Beyond that, at, by this point, all the nouns have become generic. It's not the spruce anymore, right? It's just the bare land. Um, so no, no particular proper noun. Um, he's creating with his word choice a sense of enduring beyond discomfort, beyond expectation of change, beyond, he would hope, any human attitude. To have a mind of winter, one must strip away not only emotion, apparently, but the varied attributes of objects such as glitter or roughness. So what happens then? The last line does something really interesting. We see not only nothing that isn't there, the usual realist posture, but the nothing that is, which is much stranger. Through a couple of grammatical tricks, like his deployment of the article the before the word nothing and the fact that the word is, the verb is, is the last word of the poem. He produces nothingness as something substantive, something almost visible. So that all of this stripping away now seems to have brought us to a place where non-being and being are interchangeable. A sort of, you might say, metaphorically, quantum vacuum. So I'm going to read a poem next of mine that is not much like this at all, but um, in a way is not unrelated because it too deals with subjectivity and objectivity and mixes them up in a, in a funny way. And in this case, I don't mean humorous, but peculiar. Okay. So I'll call it up. So first of all, it's titled Chirality, but that title is not terribly important, it turns out, in the poem. In case you don't know, uh, something is chiral, chiral when it can't be superimposed over its mirror image, like the famous example with hands like this. They're the same, but can't be mapped over each other. And that's the important definition in chemistry, and well, in chemistry. But um, it means something different in physics, and for you two or three or four physicists out there, you're going to know that I'm not getting it quite right, but please forgive me. But um, 
Okay, in physics, it has something to do with the rotation of a particle's polarity in relation to its direction of travel. And this can be affected by the position of an observer, which, 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 which end you're, he's seeing, he or she. So I first learned this while reading an article about neutrinos. And my first reaction, I admit, was that given how hypothetical, if you know anything about neutrinos, you know what I mean, but uh, anyway, given how hypothetical this observer must be, the neutrino was very much on its own, its progress through space a lonely passage. Okay, now I have to retrieve the book. I think I can stand up again now. I think I've recovered. Okay. Chirality. If I didn't need to do anything, would I? Would I oscillate in two or three dimensions? Would I summon a beholder and change chirality for him? A massless particle passes through the void with no resistance. Ask what it means to pass through the void. Ask how it differs from not passing. That's the kind of question that always pops to my mind when I read these articles, like, naively maybe, but if you're passing through a void, how do you know you're passing? The only way that you know you're traveling is if you're traveling in relation to something else, but anyway, um, I think. Okay, so um, now this may seem pretty fanciful, fanciful, but why not? Imagining yourself either in front of or behind a neutrino as it travels through space is somewhat fanciful too. If Wallace Stevens wanted to strip human subjectivity off a snowy day in Connecticut, where we might reasonably expect to find it, I perversely added it to the relation of neutrino and the hypothetical observer in deep space. I guess you could say Stevens and I are both dealing with subjectivity at its limits. Am I projecting? Sure, but this is a deliberately unlikely counterintuitive projection. And I know that human projection onto nature runs the risk of being arrogant, and I see why science needs to practice and cultivate objectivity so that it doesn't end up just finding the results it expects. On the other hand, it may not be possible to rid the observed world of the subject, after all, of point of view. To sum up, in the most exciting art and science, I think anyway, thought and feeling, imagination and observation meet and inform one another. So as I said earlier, compartmentalization is the enemy of creativity. That's the problem that Brian Keating and I were grappling with, however awkwardly, when we tried designing our poetry for physicist class. I hope there will be many other such experiments in cross-disciplinary teaching and work. Now I'm going to read a short set of poems without much comment, maybe a little. Some of these relate to cosmology, but others pull from biology, ecology, cognitive science. No poem of mine is ever about just one thing. They're all hybrids, chimeras. A poem is an open door. Okay, so this first poem that I'm going to read, there is a bit of a backstory to. My son is a biologist. So we were having a conversation, I think, about evolution. And he accused me of using, of anthropomorphizing it. And I didn't mean to, it's not really what I meant, but that's the way language works. There always has to be an agent doing something in language. Language is very agential. So it sounded like I was doing it. It's hard, it's hard to banish, uh, you know, personification and anthropomorphism. So um, I wrote this poem as a kind of argument, I guess, or well, sort of talking back to him. I was also in a very bad mood at the time because I'd been diagnosed with cancer. That was years ago and I seemed to be okay, except for the weird fainting spell, but that's probably not cancer. Um, anyway, so bad mood and thinking about evolution. Simple. Complex systems can arise from simple rules. It's not that we want to survive, it's that we've been drugged and made to act as if we do. 
while, all the while, the sea breaks and rolls painlessly under. If we're not copying it, we're lonely. Is this the knowledge that demands to be passed down? Time is made from swatches of heaven and hell. If we're not killing it, we're hungry. Then I have a few, that's in this book, then I have a few loose ones. We'll see, I might sit down again. That felt pretty good. And this one is kind of based in cosmology, but I was also reading a book about autism, so things come together. Concept. He would spin until he shone, until he shone and exploded. Then he'd suck it up and start over. That was his big idea, his pleasure. They called it stimming for self-stimulation, but they weren't real. That's enough, they said, enough for proof of concept. And this one has two parts. The first part has to do with physics, and the second part has to do with biology. Natural histories. Since the irrational, because I said so, start, they'd had their differences. Color that isn't really color, spin that isn't spin, because attitude's best when it has no content. Ask a physicist what charge is, he'll say your question makes no sense. Word had it that if they surrendered their feckless ways and their lives with no end, if they joined up, they would get a head, something to speak for them. The head says, I don't want to die, says, I am all alone here. And then I've got a couple about, well, environmental stuff. Preview. There are worldwide catastrophic storms when Earth's network of weather control satellites is sabotaged by unknown enemies. As fire rages through the western forest, Jeff Bridges snarls, if you want a piece of me, come get me. The baby says, mmm, mmm, to the stuffed fish, then hits it against her closed mouth. Ah, ah, she says, holding it at a distance. She opens and closes the palm of one hand. Bye-bye, we say for her. Bye-bye, fishy. And this, I got the, the, few, the first couple of lines from artist statements that I saw on Facebook. My erasures, that's a kind of a poetic device, but you don't have to know about that. My erasures. My erasures were featured. I collected debris to sell as crash art, crush porn. Say goodbye to Lonesome George, the last Galapagos tortoise. I was a pushover for the laws of physics. I pictured us as two seals hauled out on a sunny rock, the roar around us a matter of course. Skip some. Let's see, how many more am I? I'm gonna read three more. Pose, and this one has something to do with AI. I read that book, some of you may have read it too, called Superintelligence. And this isn't all to do with that, but it partly rips off of it. Pose. So the problem we pose is how to create an intelligent agent and then prevent it from destroying this world. Content monitoring that required the AI's intentional states to be transparent might not be feasible for all architectures. A long green straw stuck in the ground with two ears, leaves, protruding on either side at intervals. What we meant by listening stations, and what, when we began to mean this. Perhaps its goal would be to have thoughts pass through its head so it could record them. Preparedness is critical. Kiss all hope goodbye. 
A friend wants you to like it. And this next one also has something to do with computers. Uh, it, in that, it starts with some words that just popped up mysteriously on my computer screen. Still don't know what this means, or especially what the word we means here. The runaround. We encountered a problem sending a command to the program. Did I say that aloud? I've broken out in imps. To be a blip in a circuit and to know it, to relish this knowledge in your private moments as all moments are gated and switched. When I mentioned hatred, I was not thinking of you, but you'd best not break our momentum, the thrill we get from our own self-loathing, that guilty snigger running round the room. Okay, just one more. Not this one, this one. Okay, I'm going to just start by saying that it, it's titled petard, which is a rather rare word from Shakespeare, and it's kind of like an explosive device or fireworks. That's all you need to know. Petard. We hope to see things as they are, by which we meant without us. We thought once we stripped away smell, taste, color, anything improper, leaving only location and number, the thing would be naked on the teeter-totter of an equation. Then Archimedes told another one, if I had a long enough lever and a fulcrum, I'd get a high-resolution image of objectified bodies and hoist myself on my own petard. Um, that one sounds like I don't like science, which is obviously not true, but, you know. Okay, now, um, shall we do some kind of Q&A? has a microphone, and so just raise your hand, and Magda will bring the microphone to you, so we can, we can all hear your question or comment. Let me just mention while you're thinking of a question or comment, that uh, both Ray's collection of poetry and the little chat book mm -hmm. are going to be on sale out front uh, when you're done, and um, Ray would be happy to sign Sure. Uh, if you buy, so or if you have something else for it, I think that's fine that too. Okay, so. I just thought I'd, I'd add that uh, Feynman didn't like philosophers either. He <laughs> once asked the question uh, or made the comment that philosophers of science are about as useful to scientists as ornithologists are to birds. Yeah, uh, right, and you know. When I say at the beginning of my talk that, there, that poets and physicists have things in common, I think I made a case for that, but I'm being also a little bit lighthearted. I mean, I don't think that the, the similarity between poets and physicists goes very deep, and I'm sure that poets are about as much use to physicists as ornithologists are to birds. <laughs> are, there, are there physicists who write poetically about the world and try to express uh, uh, their physical thoughts uh, through poetic uh, music? Uh, well, there, are, there have been some who've tried. <laughs> there's a guy, there's, there's a physicist, not a guy, a physicist who studies neutrinos in Spain, a Spanish guy named, I don't, some of you physicists may know him, so I shouldn't say this, uh, Juan Jose Gomez Cardenas, who writes poetry in English and he sends it to me sometimes. And I say, that's very nice. So, you know, I'm sure that our, <laughs> but if I tried to do physics, it would be, <laughs> would, well, never mind. He, he does better with poetry than I would do with physics. I don't, to, to be serious, I don't know of anyone in modern times who has done that uh, well. But, um, I mean, going back, of course, there were, well, going back, there was not physics as we know it now, but in the ancient world, there was no such division. Of course, and Lucretius was writing poetry about scientific theory. 
Um, thank you for this. Um, I have a question to, to pick up on a word you just used, um, your lightheartedness uh, of what some of the poems and your thinking. I've been working for uh, the past year plus with a physicist mm -hmm. uh, about trying to understand each other. Um, one of his comments was for a physicist, um, mathematics is like going to the hardware store. Uh, for a mathematician, it's like going to the toy store. Yeah. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the playfulness of physics and the playfulness of poetry. Yeah. Well, you just you just said that it was like going to the hardware store, so which is not what I uh, not uh, not what I associate with playfulness. I would think it, it occurs to me because I've actually known two mathematicians, not terribly well, but well enough. And it struck me that they're sort of like artists in a way. I mean, they do math for the pleasure of it. Uh, you know, they do it the way that poets write, not because not because it's going to make them rich, not because it's going to, you know, do anything in the world. It may, but that's not why they do it. They do it because it seems, I don't know, I, but it, it, seems like it, it seems like they do it the way artists do art to me. Um, and I, I don't know. I imagine some physicists have that same feeling, but of course there are more practical applications to physics. Um, and, I mean, I'm also serious about poetry, too. I don't, I don't really think that, that humor and, and that being humorous and being serious are actually, again, I don't want to separate things, you know, I don't want to compartmentalize. I mean, comics, comedians are deadly serious. They, they make jokes about the things we fear the most, right? Um, you spoke about subject-object distinction, mm -hmm. and a uh, philosopher, Heidegger, also mentioned about that dichotomy and how that way of thinking mires us in a metaphysical uh, way of looking at things mm -hmm. that's, that alienates from how things unfold into being. So I was also very curious about how we can use language in po uh, poetry to go beyond our subject-object dichotomy in language and liberate ourselves from alienating ourselves, right? So is there another, and I saw that one of your poems actually uh, attempts to do that, so is there another one of your poems, another one of yours or one that you, uh, one of your favorites that also attempts to liberate us, liberate us from the subject-object dichotomy? Well, that's a subject that interests me, but I think that there probably are a lot of my poems that touch on it, and I don't think I'm going to be able to come up with one off the top of my head. Buy my book, buy my book. Um, the small one, it's not, you know. Um, yeah, I think that's an important question, and I think that there are uh, philosophy of science people who are working in that now. Um, I think uh, uh, Karen Barad is working on um, agential as an agent realism, you know, with the idea that every, every object, every, you know, uh, like, an atom is, is, is a sort of uh, subject. Um, I mean, I know that sounds, that just sounds like uh, pantheism, but, um, but on the other hand, you know, on the other hand, why not? <laughs> okay, that's all I can say about that now. I, if, I'm still feeling a little off, or I'd probably be able to jump up and come up with a poem, but it's just not gonna happen right now. Okay, anybody else? Please join me in thanking Ray Armitrout.